Hello, what's up everyone? This is Ants Portugal here and today we're going to continue our ant care species guide series and today we're going to do that on a new species, this time from the genus Chromatogaster and today we're going to be talking about Chromatogaster scutellaris. Now, of course, let's get Jeff to tell us how it's supposed to be said, Jeff. Chromatogaster scutellaris. See, that's very nice. Um, okay, Jeff, thank you. Okay, now... Uh, as always, I'm going to do the the ant care species guide video as we always do, and I'm a little bit rusty because I've been working on my collection videos, and I've also been working on getting a another edit software in which I can record with actual video and audio on my phone and then transfer it to the to the PC and edit it there. So maybe not the next video, not the one after that, but maybe in the near future I'll be doing videos that are not my voice over image i'll probably show my my and my all my my setups again when i do that when i can actually do that so let's get that out of the way today we're going to be talking about chromatogaster scutellaris now chromatogaster scutellaris is a very interesting species of ant but it's not a very easy to keep one i would say so let's get into it first of all Chromatogaster scutellaris, as all chromatogasters, can lift their abdomen and squirt formic acid um, in the outward. They're very prone to using formic acid. Also, they're although they're not that small, they're very fast growing, and they need uh, they need constant upgrades to their setups. This is true to almost all chromatogaster species, of course. But today we're going to focus on this one because of its dis distribution. You know, Chromatogaster scutellaris exists all throughout the, um, the Western Mediterranean. They go as east as Greece and as west as Portugal or, I don't know, Morocco. Um, they go as far north as uh, Germany, but I wouldn't say they live in North Germany. Maybe they'll be found in the south. And they can also live in. They also live in North Africa. They're very. They're very prominent in the, um, in Algeria, Tunisia, and in the Europe. They're very prominent in Spain, Portugal, Italy, and a little bit on the south of France. They are species that has some interesting behaviors that we'll be going over in just a second. Okay. So first of all, let me give you some numbers of some stuff that you should know if you want to care for them. First of all, the the queen is about eight millimeters long. They are all they are all black, like shiny black with a red head, and uh, the workers are somewhere between three, four, or five millimeters. They also have a black body and a red head. I find that the red head is less prominent in the queen than in the workers. The workers have a very vibrant red head. Okay, now this queen is. Monogenous. It will form a colony monog monogamously. Monogenously. Okay. All right. But here's the thing. Chromatogaster is actually able of doing something called how's it? Uh, oli oli oligonogy. <laughs> Oligonod. Oligog. Oligogony. Oligogony. That's how. That's how it goes. Oligogony. 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 Monogen. Oligogen. Okay, it's probably molygogen, oligogen, oligogeny. I'll call it oligogeny, all right? Uh, here's the thing about oligogeny, is that what it, what it means is that a colony can accept new queens, but the queen will not accept the new queen. So if you have a small colony and you introduce a new queen, they'll, be, they'll fight to the death. If you, get, if you have a mature colony and you, int and you introduce a new queen, uh, the workers will maybe take the new queen in but if the queens meet in the nest they'll be fighting over who's dominant this is interesting because you can actually have a monogenous species a monogenous colony but <laughs> it's kind of risky all right so do it on your own now with only one queen the colony gets to say a few a few a few thousand workers not not more than three thousand and that's in, in that's in like optimal food temperature and humidity conditions speaking about conditions 
the the perfect conditions for these species would be and again give them a gradient i'll be throwing some numbers at you but remember the gradient the humidity should always be somewhere between 50 to 60 percent in the nest and in the arena it should be basically the same uh although in the arena of course you can go drier instead of going more humid uh, when it comes to temperature, they can handle uh, a wide variety. Uh, I would say they're not as resistant as Mesa Barbaros, but they are still a temperate species. I wouldn't say you should keep them at more than 26 or 27. And definitely do not keep them below 20 when it's not winter. When it is winter, you can keep them at around 10 to 15 to 3 to 6 months during the winter, maybe do three or four, not to not push it more than that, because if they wake up, if they, if they just kinda wake up, it's very bad. Now, here's the very interesting part about these species, is their nest building, okay? Last time we talked about a species that built a cool nest, we did Polyrachis dives, which, which are the lesser weaver ants. Now this time we're going to be talking about a paper ant, or a, it, that's what I call them, because just like paper wasps, they create paper nests in trees. These paper nests are done exactly in the same way as paper wasps do theirs, I think. They gather debris and they mix it with saliva and stuff, and they they, they build a nest, a nest that is sort of made of like hardened sheets of mud. Yeah. Uh, now. They can and will live in formicaria that you provide, the nests that you provide. Uh, but it's very cool to have them build a paper nest. Here's the thing. It's it's a lot more easy to get a polyrachis to build a, a weaved nest than it is to get Chromatogaster to build a paper nest. Because in the wild, all polyrachis will build a nest, a weaved nest. In the wild, not all Chromatogaster scutellaris will build will build a paper nest. So if you want to try it, I'd say what you want to do is put them in a sort of naturalistic-ish setup, which is which should be big when the colony is already big. Give them like four or five test tubes where they can nest temporarily, and see if they will build up in the trees. They might also just find the corner and live in the corner. Because one thing that I've noticed with keeping Chromatogaster is that all Chromatogaster species will tend to to nest in tubes or in the outworld from time to time, creating either satellite nests or just moving some brood to be there for a day or two when they're in pupa when they're in pupal stage, or maybe just bring the queen along and just set up a station with of like egg laying. I don't know. They tend to do that because they're comfortable with it, okay? One other thing you should know about these guys is their diet, all right? I have not talked about their diet. What you can feed these guys is insects, sugar honey water, or honeydew, and maybe fruits. They're small species of ant, and normally small species of ant do not take fruits very well unless they're big species of ants, they're, they're, unless they are a big colony, okay? When... They are a big colony, fruits is alright, just like the rest. Insects is very important to them, or at least they s almost all chromatic acids seem to love their, their meat, their protein. And I find that they jump, or I would say crawl, onto every single piece of insect that you give them very, very quickly. Alright? One other thing, one other thing that you should keep in mind is that this species can be very aggressive. They do not have the ability to arm a human being as they cannot bite your skin. They have very potent formic acid and they can shoot it out of their butts, their raised butts, but they cannot harm you. So what happens is that when you come in to the proximity of the nest and you breathe, you breathe on top of it or you just, you know, you just make some movement, turn some lights on. They'll, they'll all come out rushing from the nest or from the test tube and they'll, they'll just stay around lifting their, their abdomen and just pointing it at the sky. And it's very cool to see them like, they're like little anti-air cannons. 
it's very cool to see. Now, one thing that is good about this species is that although they are three to four millimeters, they are a very, very well built little ant. All right, they're very robust. They have little nice big butts, and they are not very, they're not very able or capable of crawling between tight spaces so they're not really escape artists and because they're small nevertheless they are small they can live on, in almost every type of nest you can do acrylic you can do cork you can do i don't know you can do white tongue you can do whatever and they'll be fine another thing i notice is that sometimes with this species the um, the queen will be very consistent Oh, well, I'm sorry, will not be very consistent with egg laying in a fashion that is almost um, programmed, like mathematical. I don't know how to how to explain this, but what the queen will do sometimes in Chromatogaster, especially in Chromatogaster scutellaris, is she'll lay a lot of eggs, then she'll stop. And when those eggs pass to larvae or somewhere along the timeline, the, she'll lay again a load of eggs. And what this does is that in one week there will be a day where you will gain plus 5 workers. Then you will gain nothing. Next week you gain plus 10. In one day. What I mean is they come in waves, sort of. You know, you have a consistent brood of larvae and they will all turn to pupae at the same time. And all the pupae will close at the same time. And sometimes they do this, sometimes they don't. And some some species do it some species don't i have not found any scientific papers on the matter but what i find by keeping them is that this happens sometimes i cannot see the advantage on doing this because you know the for, for example the the passage from pupae to worker is a very important stage and must be carefully monitored by adult workers and if you have say one newborn a day it's okay, but if you have like 10 newborns in one day that should be spread all over the week, it's harder on the ants. I don't know why they do this, but sometimes they do. So, basically, if you want to be the best Kramatsugarster carer, caretaker, what you should do is just follow the tips I've given you. <laughs> For what I've said, I've kept a truckload of different Kramatsugarster species, and they all grow to huge numbers very fast. I've got lots of species in my area, so it's a um, lots of species in my area. So it's a genus that I really like because what I do is I capture some queens, I raise them for half a year, one year, and then there'll be a big colony that I can enjoy, and then I'll give, I'll I'll set them loose because I found them in my area, so they're native, which means it's okay for me to collect them keep them, get them to be a big a big colony, then send them away. Now, here's the thing about this, this actual actual thing is that I'll probably make a, a video on how to, really, to properly release your ants because it's the thing that you should know how to do, okay? Now, this was the video, this is it. I have no more information, so if, as always, if you have anything to add, if you have any questions that you need answered, go down to the comment section below, and tell me what you thought about this. Another thing is, I have one, two, three, four, five, five more videos plans on these series, uh, Ant Care Species Guide. But I am not too comfortable choosing ant species because I don't know what you guys want to watch. I usually do, okay, I like this species, I'll do this one because I'll probably remember everything from memory. And um, that's usually what I, go, what I do. But... What I, want to do, what I want you to do today is, if you got to this part of the video, I mean, like five of you will, please leave a comment down below telling me which species of ants you would like me to, to do an ant care species guide on. If I, I don't mind having to, to research a lot about them before the video, it's okay because it's what I love doing. Okay, it's alright. And maybe I've kept them already and I'll know everything from memory or I'll have a paper of mine written about them. Okay? Also, like the video if you if you liked what I do, what I've been doing, and share 
please share my channel with everyone you know. I'm always saying this, but I really want my channel to grow. Recently, I've had a <laughs> big boost in <laughs> subscriber numbers. Uh, you know, it's big for me because in the last two days, I think I've gained 20 subscribers, which is amazing considering I thought I would, I would do a video and then give up. All right. So share my channel, get it, get everyone to watch it. I love what I do here. And if you love my content, please go ahead. Thank you very much. See you in the next one. Bye-bye.